ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. It is 7.33 p.m. on Tuesday, August 13th, 2024. Uh, good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. First, I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present uh, from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, we have Patrick Hanlon. Here. Uh, Venkat Holly. Here. Uh, Daniel Riccadelli. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Adam LeBlanc. Here. Good to have you all with us. Uh, Mr. DuPont is unavailable this evening. Um, and so I will be, excuse me, when we introduce the cases, I will ask uh, one of the associates to, to step in for that case. Uh, on behalf of the town, we have Colleen Ralston, our zoning assistant. No, Colleen. Here. Here. Good to have you with us. Um, and then... We have two cases uh, where we are just voting on the final decision this evening. That's 39 Amherst Street and 22 Lawrence Lane. Uh, I see that Mr. Smith is here uh, from 39 Amherst Street. Um, I don't know if anyone is here from 22 Lawrence, but um, they do not need to appear uh, at this hearing. Um, appearing for docket 3809, uh, 314 Mass Ave, we have Arthur uh, Jovellis. Present. Good to have you here. And Thank then for Dr. 3811, uh, 9 Carl Road, we have Beth Aaronsburg Fitzpatrick. Here. Good to have you with us as well. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects signed into law on March 29, 2023. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely, so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. I'd like to take a quick notice on procedures. Uh, once we get to the public hearings, at the end of discussion of each individual hearing, the board will vote to either continue the public hearing to a specific date, to continue receiving testimony on the matter, or the board will vote to close the public hearing ending at receipt of new testimony. The board will then proceed to the next item on the agenda. Over the coming days, the board will prepare a draft decision based on the testimony received and the discussions that took place during the public hearing, and that decision will be voted on at the next available meeting of the board. In practical terms, for those hearings before the board this evening, there will not be an official vote for or against your project this evening. That vote will take place at our next available meeting when we have a draft decision to review and upon which our vote will rest. Um, so this brings us to the start of our meeting. Um, 
So going to the agenda, um, I'm going to go ahead and start with two administrative items, and then I'm going to delay the rest of the administrative items uh, to the end, um, and we'll dial around to them. So I would like to move to item number two on our agenda, which is the vote on the decision uh, for three docket 3807, 39 Amherst Street. Um, so this is a decision that was written uh, by Mr. Hanlon, distributed to the board for questions and comments. Um, and a final version was posted uh, to the board this afternoon. Are there any additional uh, questions or comments in regards to the written decision for 39 Amherst Street? Seeing none, uh, the chair would propose a vote. Um, that the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington approves and adopts the written decision in docket 3807, 39 Amherst Street, which grants a special permit under sections 3.3 and 5.3.18 in the zoning bylaw. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. And a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Uh, Mr. DuPont. <laughs> Mr. Daly. <laughs> Uh, so, um, Mr. DuPont is unavailable to vote at this time. Uh, Ms. Hoffman was not present at one of the sessions for this hearing, so uh, Mr. LeBlanc will be voting with us this evening. So, vote of the board, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That is approved. That brings us to item number three on our agenda, which is the dis vote on the decision on docket 38082 Lawrence Lane. Uh, again, this is a decision that was written by uh, Mr. Hanlon, distributed to the board for questions and comments, and a final version posted to the board this afternoon. Are there any additional questions or comments in regard to the written decision for 22 Lawrence Lane? Seeing none, the chair will propose a vote that the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington approves and adopts the written decision for docket 3808-22 Lawrence Lane, which grants a special permit under sections 3.3 and 5.3.9.D in the zoning bylaw. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. And a second. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gadelli. Um, Where Mr. LeBlanc voted on the previous vote. I will give Ms. Huffman a vote in place of Mr. DuPont this evening. Uh, Mr. Han, uh, so vote of the board. Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Holly? Yes. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Ms. Huffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That is approved. So I'm going to skip over items four through eight. Uh, which are the remaining administrative items and move on to uh, the public hearings that are on for this evening. Um, before opening tonight's meeting for public hearings, here's some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicant to introduce themselves or themselves and make their presentation to the board. I'll then request that members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. And after the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. At the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote to either continue or close the public hearing. All votes will be conducted by a roll call vote. The final vote on any matter before the board will be taken up at a subsequent meeting once the written decision has been drafted and provided to the board. The decision will then be filed with the town clerk starting the 20 day appeal period under state law. After that time, the applicant may proceed with their building permit. However, under state law, no decision granted by this board shall take effect until a certified copy of the final decision has been filed with and recorded at the Middlesex South Registry of Deeds in Cambridge by the applicant. So with that, it brings us to item number nine on our agenda this evening, which is docket 3811, 9 Carl Road. Um, so I would ask the applicant to please um, introduce themselves and tell us what they are proposing to do. Hi, everyone. My name is Beth. Um, I'm opening to, I am proposing to open a pediatric speech, um, speech, office at my house. Um, I've been a speech therapist. Ther 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 I've been working with pediatric speech pathologists, um, th th therapy for 15 years now. Um, I've in a variety of different settings and um, I've noticed there's a lot of long waiting lists for private practices. 
And I thought we would benefit from having another place in town. Great, thank you. And um, in your application, you included a floor plan of the house. Yes. Um, which I can pull up here. Um, so we we're showing here the. So I'm assuming that the. Uh, People, clients who would be coming would come to the front door. Yes, to the front door and around. Yeah. yeah. And then service at the in the office. Yes. Um, and, and it only occurs on this first floor. It's the only place yes. that, that yes. it was yes. occupied. Um, and then from the uh, from the application you provided as well, uh, you're saying that no non-residents are going to be employed. Yes. Um, as we've shown here, it's not more than 25% of the existing gross floor area. There is, uh, There would be no visible display of wares or goods, that no visible advertising, um, and there would not be a detrimental impact to the neighborhood due to exterior appearance, emission of odor, gas, smoke, noise, or electrical disturbances. Um, and then just to, to uh, people who would be coming uh, would they be parking on the street or would they be parking off street? They would be parking in the street, but um, we live on a small private road with ample street park parking. Um, and we have two spots in um, in um, in front, 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 front of our house. Okay. Um, I plan to see kids primarily during the school day. So there won't be little kids around playing in the street. Everyone should be at school. Um, and I don't see having a major impact. They shouldn't take up the parking in front of anyone, anyone else's house in on our on on our our street. Okay. And did you say that Carl Road is a private way? It's not a private way. It's just a small side okay. street that no cars drive down unless you have to be um there. Okay, but it it is a public way. It's not a private street. It is a public okay. way. Perfect. Go ahead and stop the share on that. Um. With that, I'll ask the board if there are um, questions and comments in regards to this application. Seeing none, um, we'll, uh, we'll be opening the meeting for public comment. So public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand, to be directed to the board for the purpose of informing its decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Those who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the reactions tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone may dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the chair, asked to give your name and address for the record and given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. And for anyone wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing, the chair will allow those wishing to speak for the first time to be called upon first. And once all public questions and comments have been addressed, the public comment period will be closed. So with that, are there any members of the public who wish to address this public hearing, uh, which is docket 38119, uh, 9 Carl Road, uh, request for a special permit to allow for um, a home occupant um, the home office. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and close the, uh, the public comment period. Um, so just a, uh, for the board, um, so this is, so actually this is a special permit. This is actually falls under 5.10.1, um, which is the home occupation section. Um, I think it just got, it was mistyped into the, um, into the, uh, the notice. Um, and we had already reviewed um, with the applicant, the conditions. So it says, uh, so five, let me go ahead and share this. Uh, so in any residential district, home occupation is permitted if all the following conditions are met. 
Uh, one, that no non-resident shall be employed therein. Uh, not more than 20% of the gross floor area, not to exceed 600 square feet, is devoted to the home occupation. No stock and trade shall occupy space beyond the limits. No display of goods or wares. All advertising devices visible from off the lot are prohibited. Uh, the building premises occupied shall not have a detrimental impact on the neighborhood due to exterior appearance, emission of odor, gas, smoke, dust, noise, electrical disturbance in any way. Um, and then that any such building shall include no feature of design not customary in buildings of residential use. Um, and so we have uh, we had reviewed those initially with the applicant and um, he stated that those conditions were all met. Um, as this is a um, is this technically a, it is technically technically a special permit. Um, I'll go back to the table. I don't know what the note says off the top of my head. This is. Residential uses, residential accessory uses. Home occupation requires a special permit. Okay, so where it is a special permit, um, the in addition to the criteria that we just reviewed, uh, we also need to review the special permit criteria, which um, are stated in section 333. which the applicant has already provided information on. Uh, so the first of those is the adverse effects of the proposed use will not outweigh its beneficial impacts. Um, so that this is a, this proposed use uh, will you know, bring one or two additional people um, at a time into this neighborhood and will not have any outward of impact um, on the neighborhood and will be providing a, a service that is valuable to the public. Uh, the requested use is allowed or allowed by special permit in the district. Um, as we noted, Section 5101 uh, uh, allows the board to issue a special permit for this use, um, which we've already reviewed the criteria for. Re uh, why the requested use is essential or desirable to the public convenience or welfare. Uh, this provides a professional service that, as the applicant has noted, is in demand um, in the neighborhood and in the in the area in general. And this will pro provide better access to uh, people looking to receive that service. Um, requested use will not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety. Uh, as the applicant has noted, this might bring one additional, two additional cars um, onto the street in any given hour. And uh, that would not be a significant increase um, to the point of creating traffic congestion or impairing pedestrian safety. Uh, requested use will not overload any public system. It won't really change the use of public systems by the uh, by the home. Um, how special regulations for the requested use are fulfilled. We uh, reviewed that at the start. Our requested use will not impair the character or integrity of the district. Uh, this uh, proposed use as a home occupancy will effectively be invisible from the neighborhood. Uh, where it will be taking place indoors in the existing house without any change to the house and will not have any outward um, advertising features. And uh, requested use will not be detrimental to public health or welfare. Um, in fact, it'll be the opposite. It'll be uh, helpful to public health and welfare by providing a, a necessary service to the community. Um, and those are the... Uh, and then the last is the requested use will not cause an excess of use detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, and that wouldn't really apply here where it is a, um, a, a single request for a, a home occupation. Um, so those are the findings that the board would need to make. Um, are there any questions from the board in regards to those findings? Seeing none. Um, the board 
should the board then uh, decide to approve the application, we have three standard conditions that we would include with any uh, special permit. The first is the plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. To be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, in this case, that's the, the plan that indicates the, the room in the house that will be occupied, will be set aside for uh, use of the home occupation. Uh, for number two, the building inspector is hereby notified there to monitor the site to proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time they determine the violations are present. Building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. And the third is that the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to this special permit grant. Are there any additional conditions that the board feels would be um, appropriate to include in its decision? Seeing none, um, Um, but I think the board is, unless there's any additional questions or comments, I think the board is prepared to close the public hearing on this item. Um, so I would ask, um, if Mr. LeBlanc could prepare a, uh, decision in this case, um, in favor of the application. Yes, sir. I can. Great. And we'll then do a final vote on uh, on approving the the written decision at our next hearing, uh, which is scheduled for. What's that be? Uh, August twenty seventh. Um, so with that, we have a motion to close the public hearing. Uh, so may I have a motion to close the public hearing for docket uh, 38119 Carl Road? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. And a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Holly. Uh, so a vote of members present, uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, so that item, uh, docket 38119 Carl Road, uh, is closed. Thank you very much for coming out this evening. And uh, we will be voting on the, the final decision at our next meeting. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. So with that, going back to our agenda, that brings us to item number 10, uh, three, eight, uh, docket 3809, 314 Massachusetts. Avenue. This is a continuation uh, from an earlier hearing. Um, so if I could ask the applicant to reintroduce themselves and tell us what changes they have they are proposing. Uh, hello, uh, uh, this is Arthur Javellis. I'm the owner, 314 Mass Ave. We're proposing a porch extension to avoid an existing gas line and to improve uh, emergency egress. At the uh, last meeting, it was requested that we have the um, surveyor and the architect render a uh, design highlighted in red with the extensions, which we've submitted to the board. And um, just awaiting on final uh, decisions, I guess, from you guys to see where we're at with that. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share those updated documents. Okay, so this is um, the site. This is the proposed site plan. Uh, so if you recall from last time, the at this the applicant had received a building permit from uh, the town to replace the existing porch at the front of the property. Um, at the time they did that, they were permit they were granted was for a porch deeper than the porch that was existing. So this is uh, the porch that was approved. Uh, excuse me, this is the part that they are proposing now, but this eight foot depth was on the permit that was previously approved. 
Um, and this is the original condition. So originally the porch was 15.5 feet from the edge of the property. Uh, and that has now been reduced to 12 feet. Uh, so we wanted, we were looking to get that confirmation. Um, and then uh, this is uh, the elevations of the proposed porch. So the portion here in, I believe blue and purple are are the existing portions, and then this portion here in red is the extension that they're uh, looking to do. And uh, again, it shows it, excuse me, in plan uh, with the proposed, and this is the additional portion that they are seeking. Um, and this is uh, that again. Yeah, so this is the, the final plan with everything included. Um, so I did have a conversation with uh, the building inspector in regards to this property. Um, I think there was some confusion when it was originally reviewed. I don't, because the the zoning bylaw is pretty clear that you do need a special permit if you're going to further uh, increase the depth of a porch within a front yard. Um, so I think, so whatever the board does, uh, it should the board decide that uh, to approve uh, the request of special permit, I think we should just be careful that our decision uh, retroactively approve the portion that has already been uh, constructed. Um, and if the board should decide that it does not approve it or cannot approve it, um, then we'll need to go back to inspectional services and determine next steps with them. Um, so with that, um, The applicable section, I believe, is five again is five three nine. Um, so I there's sort of two sections that may or may not <clears throat> so apply in this case. The first is is the section A, um, the porches not more than 25 square feet in floor area or more than one story in high, which do not project more than three and a half feet beyond the line. The foundation may extend beyond the minimum yard regulations otherwise provided. For the district, the porches and enclosed entrances larger than that allowed above may extend into the minimum yard regulation otherwise provided for the district by special permit. Um, it also, section D, where we do the porches, decks, and steps and landings and the required setback are not considered within the foundation and may not be enclosed, extended, or built upon by, by special permit. Um, I think in this case, probably A is the, the, the one that is more governing. Um, but with that, are there questions from the board? Mr. Chair. Mr. Riccadelli. So, um, I, I think you explained this, but let me just ask one follow-up question. So, uh, the applicant, um, originally proposed the smaller porch that did not go all the way to the edge of the building that was impacted by the location of the gas line. And that permit was approved by inspectional services. Is that correct? That is correct. So that that exists, the, the, the porch that's at the existing depth, that eight foot depth that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, even though it should have required a special permit was, was already approved. Correct. Okay. I, I think, you know, my two cents is that uh, there's no way, uh, because codes are written the way they are, and they're sometimes sort of confusing to understand, that uh, unless the applicant was told that the additional depth would not be um, allowed by right, mm -hmm. then there's probably no way that he would have known that. So um, I'm inclined to say that uh, the, the depth issue uh, is is sort of okay because I think um, I think we sort of should have 
address that uh, <laughs> when the initial permit was was issued or uh, so I, I think now sort of retroactively, uh, I, I would be comfortable with the additional depth. Uh, the width, I think, looks nice. Um, I, I don't have any problem with the aesthetics or the uh, or the um, appropriateness of the, the full width porch. That's very common in the, this neighborhood. So. Great, thank you. Other members of the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. The first part, the first sentence in Section 539A um, speaks of expansions, extensions that are not more than one story. Uh, and I take it that we assume that in the second sentence, when it says porches and enclosed entrances larger than that allowed above, mm -hmm. includes uh having something that goes on a second story is because my understanding here from looking at the pictures is that there's a second story here and i just want to be clear that that's the interpretation that we have of the second sentence of the bylaw that essentially going up another story is just another way of being larger than what was allowed by right by the first sentence i think that would be a fair interpretation that it could be larger in any of the three dimensions, provided that the special permit is granted. Right. Any other questions from the board? Seeing none, I'm gonna go ahead and open the hearing for public comment. Um, again, as said earlier, public comment is taken as it relates to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Uh, you may dial, uh, if you are calling by phone, you can dial star nine. If you are on Zoom, you can use the raise hand um, under the, this is the reactions tab. I don't see a reactions tab anymore. Oh, there it is, it's react to now, excuse me, the react tab. I keep changing the name. Um, Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close public comment uh, for this hearing. So what the board has before it, this is an application uh, under section 539, uh, we'll call it 539A um, of the zoning bylaw to allow for a porch uh, within the front yard setback that's larger um, than would typically be allowed. And um, the applicant has provided the documentation showing uh, what they're proposing. So the existing, the setback, the initial setback of the porch was 15.5 feet. Uh, and the proposed is only 12 feet. Um, and so that change of three and a half feet from the original position to the new position is, uh, would be the, the portion that the board would need to review. Um, as was, was asked by Mr. Hanlon, this where this also, it's a porch that has a deck over the top of the porch. Um, it's that upper portion uh, would be approved under the special permit as well. Um, and would, as was shown in the final drawings that were submitted to the board, uh, subsequent to the last hearing, the front porch will extend across the front of the building um, wider than the, the previous porch had been. So where there are no uh, specific requirements that the or findings that the board needs to make in terms um, <clears throat> of the porch, so that the, what would be then before the board are the standard uh, requirements for a special permit. Um, so the first being that the adverse effects of the proposed use will not outweigh its beneficial impacts. Uh, there won't really be a change in the in the use. This is still a two-family house. It still has a porch on the front. It just has a, a larger porch. Um, and whereas this is not on a small residential street, but is on you know the major thoroughfare of the town, it's a um, it would seem to be appropriate that the that the porch be uh, of a larger scale. 
Uh, the requested use is allowed or allowed by special permit in the district. Um, as we noted, this under 539A, the board is allowed to um, approve a, an extended porch like this. Um, it was in the front yard setback. Uh, so why the requested use is essential or desirable to public convenience and welfare. Um, so it's important to the town that uh, that properties be maintained. The owner is uh, undertaking renovations to the home. This larger porch uh, is a public feature. It's something that is actually driving down Massachusetts Avenue. It's actually fairly prominent uh, being on the outside of a of one of the big bends in the, in Massachusetts Avenue. Um, and this will, uh, this larger porch will create a nice inviting uh, feature for the property and for the town. Um, the, the requested use will not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety. Uh, while the porch does extend 3.5 feet closer to the curb, um, it does appear to be sufficiently far from the uh, not only the driveway to this property, but also the driveway to the adjacent Walgreens property. Um, and so it will not hide sight lines um, that would be important for pedestrian safety or for uh, traffic moving in and out of those areas. Uh, the requested use will not overload any public system. Um, there will be no public systems impacted by this uh, proposed use with the exception of uh, possibly an extra light bulb or two for the deck. Uh, and porch. Um, the special regulations for the requested use are fulfilled. We noted there are no special regulations. The requested use will not impair the character or integrity of the district. Um, this is sort of a unique property being uh, sort of sandwiched between a commercial and a church uh, on the other side of the, 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 the street. Um, and so the this porch is being uh, carefully considered in regards to uh, the, it, the way it appears and the way it fits in with the neighborhood. And so it will not impair the character or integrity of the district. Our requested use will not be detrimental to the public health or welfare. It's just providing an open porch and deck for the use of the, uh, the residents of the property. And the requested use will not cause an excess of use detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, this is an existing uh, property we're not changing the use of the property we'll maintain as it is and it is not there's not an excess of this use in this neighborhood um are there any questions uh or additions to the uh, findings as i have read them seeing none um as we stated on the previous case, when the board approves uh, a special permit, there are three standard conditions, which we've previously read into the record this evening. Um, so I would the, ask that the board include those three uh, conditions in the decision. Are there any additional conditions that the board feels would be appropriate uh, should the board vote to grant this application? Seeing none, um, I believe the board has sufficient information um, to uh, render a decision. Um, and so are there any final questions uh, before a vote to close the hearing? Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion to close the public hearing for docket 3809 through, oh, before I do that. Um, so uh, we will need a written decision. Uh, so if I could ask Mr. Riccadelli if he could prepare a written decision for the board to review in favor of uh, granting the special permit. Sure. Perfect. Then with that, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing for docket 3809, 314 Massachusetts Avenue. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. And a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Gadelli. So a roll call vote um, of the board. Um, Ms. Hoffman, I believe you missed one of the sessions on this one. Um, so I will ask you on this. Uh, Mr. DuPont is not here this He's evening. Not here. Hanlon. <laughs> yes. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. The chair votes aye. So uh, that uh, case, that hearing is closed. Uh, and again, thank the applicant for um, 
coming back and providing the additional information is very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. You're welcome. Okay, so with that, close a few of these things. Go back to our agenda. Okay, so this brings us back to uh, the administrative items on our agenda. So the next four items, items four through seven, these are approvals of minutes um, that were prepared by uh, Colleen Rolson for all of us to review um, and submit any questions or comments or corrections. Um, are there, so I'm just gonna go through them one by one. Um, we'll vote on them each individually. So with that, are there any additions or changes to the minutes from May 14, 2024? Seeing none, I may I have a motion to approve the minutes from the May 14, 2024 meeting of the board. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. And a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Holly. Uh, so vote of the board. Mr. DuPont is not here this evening. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Mr. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. Chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. Brings the next set, uh, which is from May 28th, 2024. Are there any um, additions to uh, the minutes that were not previously submitted? Seeing none, I will accept a motion to approve the minutes from May 28th, 2024, meeting of the board. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hinn. And a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Holly. Uh, vote of the board, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Mr. Chair, I was not at this meeting, so. Oh, uh, thank you. I don't think. Thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That is approved. Brings us to the next set of minutes, which is from our June 11th meeting of the board. Um, are there any additional uh, changes or corrections to those minutes? Seeing none, I'll accept a motion to approve the minutes from the June 11, 2024 meeting of the board. So move it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. And a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Holly. Uh, so a vote of the board, Mr. Hanlon. Yes. Mr. Holly? Aye. Uh, Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. That is approved. That brings us to the last set of minutes, which is from our June 25th, 2024 meeting. Um, are there any additional uh, corrections or changes to those minutes from June 25th? Seeing none, the chair will take a motion to approve the minutes from the June 25th, 2024 meeting of the board. So moved to. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. And a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Riccadelli. Uh, so vote of the board, Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Holly? Mr. Chair, I'm not sure if I was part of this meeting. Um, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Riccadelli? Yes. Ms. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair vote by that is uh, approved. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? There's, there's been, a, I've, I've been trying to lead the way, but um, the reason I'm saying yes rather than I is because mm -hmm. you can't believe how comical the transcript is when it tries to capture what I means. Usually it says hi. So, you know, Mr. Ducker Alley, hi, and so forth. Yes, the transcript gets gets right mostly and it makes a clearer record. Thank you for that. I had not even considered that. Um, so that brings us on our agenda to item number eight, which is uh, proposed revisions to the online application um and the uh, rules and regulations for the board 
So let me go ahead and bring those back up. Okay. Uh, so this is the proposed um, checklist. So essentially, as I'm sure everyone has sort of noticed, um, with the switch to the online uh, application, we do end up having a lot more uh, sort of discrepancy on what is submitted as a part of the application um, that then comes before the board. Um, in many cases, there are, because of the way we used to run the application, it made sense to have the same figures appear in different places. Now that it's all online, it really doesn't make any sense to have additional, uh, to ask the same piece of information multiple times. Uh, we, it really should only be asked once. Um, and I, my sense from having sort of put in lots of fake applications for my house um, into the system and sort of seeing some of the information we've received from some of the applicants, I think a lot of people come to the online application not being prepared um, and then feeling like they just, they need to put something in and so they put something down. So I thought it would be helpful uh, for the board to uh, talk about putting together some, what I would sort of consider like a checklist that includes the information that they they need to provide, but also provides sort of a workbook for the applicants to go through first uh, to figure out what all the numbers are that they're going to need to be asked for so that when they do fill out the online application, uh, hopefully they've considered what all those figures are first. Um, so I had put together um, a draft and sent it around. Um, I know that, note at the same time, I know Mr. Hanlon has been talking with um, the town because we often, there are other cases where there, you know, is not an obvious front, rear, left side, and right side. Uh, that if it is a through lot, it will have two sides and two fronts. If it's a corner lot, it'll have two fronts, a side and a rear. If it's an inland lot, it'll have a rear and three sides. Um, and so we need to sort of think about the best way to capture that. Um, I do want to have a conversation with uh, Carrie O'Brien in the, in the in special services office to see if we can have a, a, an application where somebody can check off what kind of a lot they have. We can give them the four images and they can pick which one looks most like theirs. And then it will ask them the appropriate uh, setback. Uh, Thanks. Mr. Mr. Moore. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I apologize. Could you please zoom this? So oh, it's bigger? a little bigger. How's that? Little, that's good. Thank you. Sure. Um, Again, apologies. Nope, that's all right. Um, I did also ask whether it would be possible for um, for some autofill features in the application so that if somebody was to check off that their property is in the R1 district, it would automatically put in what all the setbacks are and all the requirements. Um, she didn't think that was possible. She's going to look in to see if that was something we they might be able to do. Um, so I just need to dial back around on that. Um, but I'll just I'll just quickly go through this. Um, if anyone has questions or comments, um, feel free to bring them up. Essentially, once we get past the sort of this first page, a lot of this will be sort of based on how I think we might want to reorganize how questions are asked on the online application. Um, so that it's section by section, it's a little bit tighter. Um, and again, we're not asking for the same piece of information more than once. Uh, so this would be, so when an applicant would come to and select that they want to do a special permit application, this would appear uh, as a download on that, that opening screen. We would have some kind of text directing applicants that they um, go through and prepare this first. 
So we note that they need to complete there's a five pages of information they're going to need to complete. Uh, they need a prepared PDF of the existing site, building setbacks, things. Uh, making sure we know that the trees and other landscape features are there. Uh, landscaped and usable open space is identified and dimensioned, and it is sealed by a surveyor or an engineer. Um, um, Mr. Chair. Mr. Moore. Um, one com are you accepting public comments as well as the board's comments? Um, I, I think for, th for this, it, I think it would make sense if there were members of the public who had comments, if they, um, if they could raise their hand, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's especially where Mr. Moore, where you, uh, you know, representing the, the tree committee, I think have bring some, some special expertise, Mr. Moore. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. And I'm sorry to, to go first here, but I just ran into something when I was looking through actually one of the, the applications or one of the early cases tonight for Carl Road. Um, I don't, as far as I could tell, it didn't say what zoning district the property was in on, on her application. Now, it could have been my ignorance and I wasn't looking in the right place, but I went through multiple pages and never once did it say what zoning district that property was in. Now, was it germane to the discussion? Perhaps it was germane to me to try and figure what might apply, and I couldn't find it. Yep. So again, again, it may have been my foolishness, but I think that should be one of the inputs that's required for auto, auto online applications. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, you're you're welcome. Um, so to to address that, it it is odd because it is the first question that appears basically on the application, and for some reason, it does not print hmm. in the printout of the application. I do not know why. Okay. Thank but that you. is definitely something to figure out. Um so we would we are asking for the site plans, asking for a proposed uh so existing site plan, proposed pipe site plan, um looking for uh existing floor plans um so these have uh i've received some comment back from mr leblanc um with some uh proposed revisions which are uh well received so here sort of pointing people to where to look for the definition of gross floor area um and again to mention so existing floor plans proposed for floor plans uh, so these are all things that these four things we would want applicants to upload so that we can review them. Um, and then the special permit criteria, this is already in there to some uh, extent, um, but just adding a little bit of commentary for what we're looking for. Um, uh, different sections so those are the same seven questions that are in the the bylaw today so now we've sort of come to the organizing it things a little bit differently so for dimensional information um you know making sure that you know as mr moore i said that we we know what the zoning district is what the present use or occupancy is what the proposed use is number of dwelling units, um, existing a proposed lot size, which in most cases will be identical, then the minimum lot size that comes from the zoning bylaw, again, frontage, existing proposed and minimum, uh, floor area ratio, proposed floor area ratio, and then telling people to enter zero if it doesn't apply, uh, because FAR applies to the higher number R districts, but not to uh, what we typically see, and I think we very rarely see anything that, that deals with floor area ratio, but we do still need to be there. So uh, just noting that. Uh, lot coverage. So lot coverage is, I need to make a note of that. Lot coverage is a term that's undefined but used in the bylaw and needs to be fixed. Um, then lot area per dwelling unit, 
existing proposed requirement. Then we get into the, the yard deaths. As we said before, these are ones where we need to be a little bit careful about how we present them because depending on the shape of the lot, we'll have different counts and we'll have some and not have others. Um, but front, left, right, rear, height in stories, the proposed height, um, and then height in feet, uh, slope of proposed dormer roofs in inches per foot. And I just clarified that because we do ask people for the slope of their roof, but it really only applies if it's a dormer and it's for calculation, it needs to be included in usable in the, uh, excuse me, in the half story calculation. Right. So trying to clarify that. Um, and then existing type of construction. So those two pages uh, for dimensional information is just for the basic information. We're asking for everything only once. Um, and then parking information uh number of spaces parking area setbacks which applies mostly in districts that are not residential districts um and then loading spaces again applies for districts that are not ours but telling people to enter zero if it doesn't apply then we get to gross floor area unfortunately we can't i don't think we can do calculations in the application um which may or may not be helpful to people, but asking for um, areas of accessory buildings, basements or cellars, first floor, second floor, attic floor, parking garages, porches, um, and then total existing gross area, total proposed, and then giving the section that they need to refer to because the calculation includes some of these, some of them get subtracted back out um and it seems like it's we're better off referring people to the section in the bylaw than giving more detailed instructions on how to calculate it here and then then doing that getting to the open space calculation um so existing landscape open space proposed landscape open space and then as a percentage, uh, we do refer up here to the section. Applicants should carefully review the definitions for landscape and usable open space as well as section 5322C. Um, and doing this for landscape and then for usable open space. So hopefully doing this just once and requesting this information only once, hopefully that will keep things cleaner. And we've already asked on the prior sheet for gross floor area. So, um, they already have that, that number calculated. And then residential design guidelines. Um, so there's currently, I believe there, um, people are allowed to, uh, or required to check off that they have re reviewed the residential design guidelines. Um, the way it's written right now, it's advisory, so we can't require it necessarily. Um, and there is a step in written into the residential design guidelines that has to be undertaken by the Department of Planning and Community Development. So I did reach out to them. Um, I have not heard comment back from them about how to incorporate that. Um, but that's something we can discuss with them going forwards. Um, but this basically puts this in front of them and forces them um to see what it is and to understand what it is um and i think i would ask uh, mr hanlon i know you had in your uh decisions been including what neighborhood district different houses are in that is comes out of the residential design guidelines um do you think that's something we should ask the applicants to include as a part of their application it sort of forces them to at least we know that they looked at it because they figured out what district they're in i think that makes sense i think that makes sense that does I mean, for, for exactly that reason they i having done this any number of times uh, especially in the turkey hill morningside area uh it's often quite difficult from 
looking at the printed uh, the material that is posted on the, to figure it out among other things the applicable map tends to to spread over two pages so the part of it is on one page and part of it is on the the next so it's a little bit difficult to do but you know to the the first principle here is that it should be part of the neighborhood block category and um uh, and all of this is aimed at um uh, taking into account the difference between one zoning district or one of the neighborhood areas and the other and i, I don't see how anyone can say that they've actually looked at this uh, and taking it into consideration if they haven't figured out where they are in it. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Moore? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, two uh, two questions. I Since you can't require that the zoning that guidelines be used, I think you might want to insert the word carefully right on what's on the screen now before the word using the design guidelines when referring to your own board, because that will even more strongly encourage, since the board says they're going to be carefully using it, that the applicant will also carefully use it. Mm -hmm. I think that might help. And also, uh, as far as I know, the town planning staff, when you say will submit, they often don't now, so I don't think you can say that yeah. anymore. Um, you might want to say that often will submit mm -hmm. or something like that, um, because I, I wish the town planning folks would weigh in on these things more now, but they seem to be doing it less so. I think it's because they're quite busy, and I understand, but um, you can't say will if they yep. don't do it every time. No, the only reason I had said will, and I... I Definitely appreciate that. Um, the reason I had said will is that in the residential design and guidelines that they wrote, they note that they will oh. provide something. Yeah. So but, I just need to come back to them and we need to make sure that they recognize that it's there. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, so it's unfortunate, but I don't think there's anybody on planning staff now who was present when we did the when we did the project to develop these uh, mr mr champa and i were both on that project um originally the idea was very different from what from from what eventually has has occurred eventually this was originally the review for compliance with the residential uh guide residential design guidelines was thought to be something that would happen as part of the process of giving a building permit and was not really focused on on special permits at all. Uh, the general thought was that Mr. Champa's department couldn't make the kind of discretionary calls on whether or not something did or didn't comply uh, and that that would be then done by the uh, by the uh, uh, by the planning department. And it was envisioned that that if they said no, that that this wasn't in compliance, that there'd be some other kind of proceeding that that would take place before them while they hashed out the differences. And that as a practical matter, people would try to comply or persuade the planning department that they would comply um, just in order to, to expedite the process and to avoid having a, a controversy in the middle of what was otherwise intended to be a, a quick process. Um, we came ultimately to the conclusion that, I mean, I'm not exactly sure ex how this happened, but in the end, we basically, these things are not really considered at all uh, in the building permit process. And, but for a long time, we were at least getting the advice from the planning department as to mm -hmm. what they thought. And we would then use it in applying the criteria in section 3.3.3, because some of those, particularly the sort of all important neighborhood compatibility part, uh, dovetails with the residential design guidelines, at least if it's the kind of development that they are in the areas that uh, those design uh, guidelines uh, do. So that's kind of where the reference in the guidelines to the participation of the planning department uh, uh, came from. 
Uh, now, I think it's exceedingly helpful to have their view on this. And if, and I think we're, they're beginning to, to do that again. They were very much pressed for a while when they were tremendously understaffed. And while they're never actually overstaffed, they, uh, uh, they're at least they've got some time to work on this uh, that they didn't have uh, before. Uh, but I think that that it may be that the way to uh, one way of addressing a concern that Mr. Moore has raised is to just specify that that uh, these guidelines, while advisory, are relevant to a number of the decision of the criteria that the board has to apply, uh, so that people understand that these are not just. Uh, motion something to go through the motions on but that it would matter uh to the ultimate decision thank you for that um, advisory are relevant to many of the criteria the board would consider thank you for that information mr hamlin and and just so you know i think this is brilliant i think this will help a great deal so I, the work that you guys are put in, I think, is uh, absolutely important and uh, will streamline everything. So good work, guys. Thank you. Um, are there other um, questions, comments on the board in regards to this checklist? Yes, I've got a couple. Please. Um I, mean, I I think it's fabulous, actually, and I think it's a it's it's a, it's an essential thing uh, to do. Um, I do think that with respect to the residential design guidelines, it ought to be made clear that that people only have to do that for R0, R1, and R2. Uh, that would apply, actually, potentially to commercial buildings in, a, in an odd way, because you, I mean, you can build commercial buildings sometimes in a residential area, uh, and it may be useful to figure out how that would that these might or might not re relate, but in any event, they don't apply to higher level uh, residential districts, and they don't apply to to business and industrial districts either. So, I think that we ought to be uh, clear by that. Um, second is I think it's helpful. It would be helpful. I'm just thinking about where people go astray, and we are getting a lot of applications where people are using a plot plan that they did for their bank when the, they got their mortgage. And it seems to me that we ought to be saying that site plans prepared for use in applying for a mortgage and limited to use for that purpose are generally not acceptable. Um, we think that's true. I, I think it's true because, well, first of all, it says right on it that it can't, couldn't be used in this purpose, which <laughs> makes it hard for us to rely on it. But secondly, is that this is going to be filed with the deed, and and uh, I think it's it's important uh, to put people on notice that that they they can't cut that corner. Um, on the <clears throat> on the special permit criteria on the next page, um, number one is pretty important, and I. And I've read it a couple of times and believe that it says exactly what the right rules are, um, but I it doesn't leap out at you. Uh, and just sort of just to, to try to capture the main the main point is that if there's not something in the bylaw that says that you can have a special permit, then you can't. Right? right, everything has to be based on the language in the bylaw, and that can either be writing SP in the table of uses, or it can be one of the various other things that say this can be done or that can be done by special permit. And what we want to know, and even more, what we want them to know, the applicant to know, uh, is what that provision is. And often what we get is not the provision that allows the special permit, but the provision that they want relief from. And that yeah. isn't the right thing. And, uh, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter very much, but sometimes it matters because this, the, there's language that goes with the so-called special regulation 
And every applicant needs to understand that in addition to meeting the general requirements, they have to meet any of these specific requirements, which incidentally, we don't have any place. I mean, this is all keyed to 3.3.3, and we don't we don't really address the problem that they may need to that there may be requirements for additional information under other uh, and under other provisions. Mm. So I, I, right. I, you know, the thing is, is that given what I just said, if you have that in mind and you read the language in paragraph one, um, it does say that. And, uh, but people don't get it. Uh, they, they repeatedly are looking at this and putting in the wrong thing. Uh, it does seem to me useful to possibly to say uh, that, indicate that when you say indicate the section of the bylaw that says that the board can provide the release you're seeking for to say this is not necessarily there is not the same as the provision from which you want relief or something like that yeah. but as long as the, but i i think it is a it's a problem to be solved to make this something that is clear enough that that even people who've never done this before and never want to do it again uh will will understand what is being asked for here mr chairman Mr. Moore. Uh, Mr. Hanlon, I, I think that's a point very well taken. Uh, perhaps an expansion of the very first sentence under special permit criteria would be helpful to explain sort of why it is well, they're going for the permit. I mean, right now it says the applicant shall prepare, but you yeah. might want to say, since the board needs to know da 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 or the board i mean you could expand this that sentence to frame much better why these matter just a suggestion thank you thank you so if if it's okay for me to jabber on i've Please. got actually just one more right on on these this list uh uh, and that has to do with the parenthetical in number two. This should relate to the general public and not residents of the property. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I mean, first of all, that's universally disregarded. And right. to some extent, it's disregarded by us. I mean, we often say, well, it is a public benefit that people can use their property the way they want. Or it's a public benefit for them to to increase the value of their property or whatever. And to some extent, I think that that is inherent in, in, you know, when you see these cases, usually the intention isn't to achieve anything particular in terms of the, of the uh, general public. And I don't think, I think that that's a lot, that's a problem with the, with the bylaw itself that you can't really address, but I wouldn't put the parenthetical in there. I just let people say what they want to say here as a practical matter it doesn't usually make, we have our own way of dealing with these things. Uh, it's very rare that what they put in this, in this provision uh, is very, is decisive in what we, in the way we do treat this. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to mislead them into thinking that, um, that uh, um, something like, I mean, here we, we repeatedly, we've gotten several cases recently about aging in place. Right. where people want to put something on the first floor in order to age in place. That happened in the Amherst case that we dealt with today. It happened in the Washington Street case where it wasn't directly an issue, but that's part of what the applicant wanted to do with their property in that case. And we that actually is something that's very that's important for the applicants. That's part of their own personal life plan. But Enabling people to stay in Arlington and age in place is also a public policy that we also have re have repeatedly done, and it's just that there's there's it's not it's often not an either or, mm -hmm. and it seems to me helpful here just to let people say whatever they think that 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 is important to them, and we can figure out what to do with it. Would it be helpful to say this should relate to the? This could relate. To, this should relate to the general public as well as the residents of the property, or do you think just not giving them direction? I was planning. I was thinking of basically just underlining public convenience or welfare, mm -hmm. and and then delimiting the parenthetical to give them the idea that they should be paying attention to the public. But other than that, not 
uh, trying to restrict them in their answers. I mean, again, our objective here is to make sure that we get useful information, right? Right. Uh, and you know, th I think that that it's unusual that what is said in that section is decisive on that question. But sometimes it's pretty helpful, and I can't. And you know, the business about aging in place is not written in the bylaw anywhere, but we do have a history of treating it as an important thing. And uh, and I guess I think that uh, uh, we, sh we in a lot of these places, I think we need to try to keep people on, on the point. But here, I think I just assume to have here what the, what what their life experience tells them is the reason that why they need something, and and we'll make use of it as we as 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 seems appropriate mm -hmm. okay. then the last thing i think is to say one of the ways of dealing with this is to is after the special permit to say add a sheet on special problems and filling this out it maybe we can call it a workbook yep. where and that can be something that can grow with time but where we know there are problems like for example informing you that you may have more than one front yard, if you have a corner lot or a through lot, that's something that you could put there to look at this. Or, you know, we knowing that that warning people about usable open space and that you have to be really, really careful about the definition and that there are part aspects of it that are not necessarily foreseeable or something. Something that says, you know, not just look it up because it's an epic, but you need to understand it and and what you think it means isn't necessarily what it means. Um, right. We can't really, I don't, you can't say it that way, but it would be useful to have those things where we see people frequently go astray and get it wrong. It mm -hmm. would be nice to have it gathered here so that they are put on notice that here's a place where you can go astray and you really do need to look this one up. Uh, and that hopefully... And then as we uncover more of these things, you know, when you have experience right. and when you see a lot of people making a lot of mistakes on certain issues, then you can stick them into the workbook saying these are the special issues to pay attention to. And with time, applications ought to get better and better. Mm -hmm. Do you think I still think, it was, go ahead. I was going to say, do you think it would be helpful to almost have that as a second document that would be on that landing page of, you know, Maybe, yeah, I, maybe incident, I think. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't focused in that way, but it is logically a separate document from the special permit criteria, right? It, right. Uh, it, it's, but wherever we think people would would see it the most and and and, and absorb its its lessons and then if you have if you have a if you treat the dimensional information i mean as i understand it what we're trying to do here in part is we're encouraging people to maintain a workbook and to work through all these numbers first and then yeah. put them into the and then you know go from the workbook into actually doing them and if you did that you might conceivably find places where you can stick a little note in under the dimensional information that refers you back to some place which in the workbook that provides more guidance on it. Mm -hmm. okay. Were there other comments you had on that document? Uh, no, not really. I th I, oh. I think we've covered we we've covered those things. I mean, obviously, every place we can get the software to make it easy i mean i obviously putting in what zoning district it is ought to pop, populate a whole bunch of fields that you don't and then and then this the application is speaking to the applicant right so right. that they're not telling us what what i mean why should they do that when they put their numbers in there they can see whether it does or doesn't comply with um uh, uh with with and then if it doesn't, there's often reasons for that. It doesn't always have to apply to comply. <laughs> but but you don't do that by fussing with the numbers. You do that by understanding why it is that if you have a number that looks too high or too low, uh, there may be a reason why that's okay. Great. Thank you. Um, 
the order sort of went through Mr. LeBlanc's comments uh, that he had provided to me. Are there other uh, comments from the board in regards to this checklist? Mr. Chair, I have just just one. Yeah, go right ahead. Maybe question or observation. So I I mean, um, I think this is great, and I think it's really helpful. Um, and you know, one thing that I wanted to ask was, ninety five percent of the cases that we see in front of us are an existing building that's being renovated or added onto or you know modified in some way. Um, and so then rightfully, all of the dimensional regulations talk about existing, propose, what the guideline is. And yeah. it would be very reasonable, I think, to say if if you had a lot that had nothing on it, you would just ignore that <laughs> existing field and, you know, fill in the proposed and, and the regulation for uh, what's in the, the zoning. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess the question... I, where where I was kind of when I was looking at it getting a little bit stumped was if you had a building that was let's say being demolished or modified enough that mm -hmm. uh you know you're not staying within that foundation anymore and then maybe those regulations kind of don't really apply any anymore to the new proposed uh so I don't know if I don't know if that is would really trip people up because like I said, it's a very small proportion of mm -hmm. cases that that might apply to. But I just wonder if maybe right. um, at the beginning, we could just clarify that, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, for a proposed structure that's being renovated, fill in, just like an instruction, like if, you're, if your building is being renovated, fill in existing and propose. Uh, if, okay. you're, if you're doing like a, a new build condition, uh, you know, ignore that. Uh, or if, or if a building was being fully demolished, you know that would be like a new build. So I don't know if others yeah. feel the same way, but just maybe just like one little bit of um, clarification on how to use that, because I could see us having to um, maybe then like backtrack, uh, like oh no, that but that doesn't apply now because these modifications have made that uh, no longer apply. So, right, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes, just Dan. This, this it seems to me this is a little bit harder than there. Are, it is often the case that relevant things do change. Um, for example, your usable open space is going to be based on the criteria for uh, the the size of the gross floor area, and the gross floor <laughs> area can easily uh, can easily change. And he, and that's even more complicated. So yeah. I guess, uh, so it isn't always true that if you're not, I mean, sometimes we need that. Other other things, I mean, if you put in addition that goes into a, to a setback, then that changes. And so it's a little hard to know. There are some things that change. Your lot size doesn't change. Uh, your frontage would typically not change. Uh, and but other things, other things do, and I'm not. I mean, I, so you're sort of, you're kind of stuck. I mean, I've seen like Mr. Riccadelli, I've seen a lot of places where they're continuing to put in unchanged, 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 because because right. that's the nature of the of the problem. Right. And often when that happens, I mean, they, we they don't even need to get a special permit because it, things are not going outside mm -hmm. the foundation wall, uh, but it's hard to articulate when it is they have to do this and when they don't. And, and Mr. Chair, if I could just respond yeah. a little bit. Um, I, I think that, yeah, Pat, like you said, I mean, there are some cases where, for instance, we, you might have a, a building that is two stories or two and a half stories. And then by nature of the renovation, it's now a three and a half story building just because you've tripped some, you know, um, right. level, a level definition uh within our zoning and that was <laughs> that that always is gonna require instruction from either isd or from right. ourselves on how to <laughs> how to interpret but i was just you know mm -hmm. just thinking um that we don't want to um get people tripped up on oh my gosh i bought this house and it has 
I don't know, I'm trying to think of an example, um, an existing structure on it that is too close to the property line and uh, I'm removing it and doing this addition. So now like, how do I answer these questions that talk about an existing uh, thing if if you're really like, it, that's not relevant to the conversation. So that's what I was trying to yeah. kind of clarify. But, but, but Dan, you actually raised a, another issue that's that we haven't really thought of, and that is that some particular situations uh, involve things that are that may or may not. We don't routinely, for example, get plans that that go through the basements and show enough to show whether the basement counts as a story or not. Mm -hmm. And that's only sometimes relevant, but when it is relevant, it's very relevant indeed. Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't know. I mean, at some point we have to be able to tell people that this covers most of the cases, but other cases not. Another similar situation is when we're doing a section six finding instead of a real special permit, um, there, the criteria are a little different. Uh, because you know we only look at the the three point three point three for guidance. The state statute wouldn't allow us to just deny something that was not substantially more detrimental because it tripped up one of the one of the criteria that that we look at. Um, and so it's you know and there it's a little bit different. And and whenever you get to a question about whether or not there's a prior nonconforming use. There's uh, this, none of this relies to that, and I'm not proposing that we make it rely to that. It would be it would be too hard, but somewhere there needs to be a way to alert people that sometimes that this isn't everything. That this is generally what you need to do, but in special circumstances, there may be other things that you need to deal with, and and then to say that and for those purposes, you should. Make sure you consult with ISD or I'm not quite sure procedurally how to handle it, but you know, they got they need to get advice directly from from ISD in, in, in terms of what what to do. What's and typically they will have already done that, right? Because how many of these people actually know why they need a special permit? They usually is when they go in for a building permit, ISD tells them we can't, mm -hmm. and you've you've got to get a special permit and this is why. And that's your point of departure. So, uh, but somewhere in the documents you need to sort it. I, it seems helpful to to say that there are special circumstances in which something more and maybe sometimes, sometimes less. Mm -hmm. And for that, you need to discuss this. And, and there may be some provision for waivers of something. If I, I'm not thinking so much of the dimensional information that is put into the computer, but, you know, there may be occasions where we need less in the way of drawings than, I mean, the case tonight, I don't know if we necessarily would need all of the drawings that are listed here, uh, the, you know, home occupation use. So uh, maybe if people want to, there ought to be some sort of a process like that. But this is, this is what's usually useful. There's, there's another thing that actually another mistake people normally make is that like if you build an addition, they give you the gross floor area of the addition and zero out everything else. And of course, what you need is not, it's the whole thing. And they don't understand that. They just figure that they, they need what, it, what applies only to, or they'll give you, they'll give you, uh, they'll give you a setback that only applies to how far the addition is set back, but it actually hasn't changed on the rest of the house and you're still not in compliance and you haven't improved your compliance situation. You've just built something that hasn't made it worse. And, you know, I, those things are useful to try to, to try to stop. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, I just kind of a Luddite comment about um, auto populating. And it's that I think in a circumstance like this, you want to sort of um, incorporate it judiciously, because if there's any opportunity, yeah. like, you know, once something's auto populated, it also means that people cannot, um, if, if none of the options apply for whatever reason, 
I can't think of a good circumstance here, but um, if if there's a problem with the auto populate, then someone has an error on their application, or if there's like a special oh, circumstance, then they can't revise it. And that could create kind of like an extra layer of headache. Um, so I'm sure there are some things that are so clear cut that it makes sense. Um, but I would I would um, lean more on on having people fill more fields in because actually it can become more confusing. And like to what um, Mr. Hamlin was just saying, if people are putting some fields in incorrectly, then that could lead to auto populated fields also being incorrect. It could just be sort of a ripple effect. Uh -huh. Point Speaking well taken, from experience with my day job, creating auto-populated checklists. <laughs> <laughs> now I know who should take the next draft of this. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else in regards to the checklist? Not. I will go ahead and I will. Actually, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moore. Um, two things. First, one of the things that may help um, generally guide some folks that would be a companion to this is um, one of those, uh, of the name of it is just uh, escaping me now, like a, um, a, a block diagram of, of decision tree. I guess decision tree is the right term. Um, that might generally take folks in the right direction. If you need to do this, then you go here. If you need to do that, you go there. And you need this additional documentation if you go to that particular option. Um, uh, you know, a sort of decision thing that would generally take people down the process where they get stuck. But just it just to, just to think about it, it's sort of a you know, stop, yeah. go, if, then sort of statement kind of thing. But I know that um, trying to come up with a grand one that would deal with all contingencies is pretty hard to do, um, just as Ms. Hoffman was sort of uh, saying. Yeah. Uh, however, it might generally help. That's just a suggestion that you might want to think about. Um, oh, thank you. Also, if you could quickly go to the uh, parking space area that you had. Uh, and the point that I'm going to be making is I'm not sure there was reference to driveways, but you might want to insert some reference to driveways because there's often confusion between parking spaces and driveways and why they are different. Um, and you might want to add something relative to driveways or curb cuts or widths or whatever just something to get also to think about because it's all about the all about the number of parking spaces but i don't see any reference to driveway for particularly yeah. the r1s in district and r2 districts okay so thank you mr chair oh just, thank you just my one half cent addition <laughs> All right, so let me swap that. So does everybody see the rules and regulations? Did that just pop up? I I see the we're still on parking information. information. Oh, you're still on parking. All right, and let's do this. Let's change the share. How does this work? Ah, here we go. Hopefully now you see rules and regulations. Yes. All right. Um, so these are the ones that we have in place today. Um, and then I have made some adjustments based on uh, switching to online. Um, and then also there are a couple of places that I think we had, I had missed the gendered nature of some of the language. So trying to adjust that as well. Um, so hopefully everyone's had just sort of take a quick read through this um, in this appeal section. It's really, it's just a gender language. 
um, under variances. Uh, I did want to add that the board has not been granted the authority to issue a use variance in the zoning bylaw, just to clarify that we do not do use variances. Um, under appointment, just to note that members of the board may be reappointed because it wasn't clear um, before. Um, under the application process, uh, so a change to the application for special permit variance shall be approved by the board and made available online through the ZBA website. The application shall include a checklist of required documentation and be accompanied by a list of current fees. Um, so I don't know if we, so the list of current fees I know is something that can be looked up. Um, so maybe accompanied is not the right word for it. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Hanley. Um, on the question, one of the things that is done in this in this change is you is to delete the word form so that we don't talk about an application form. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that 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 introduces a an ambiguity that that can lead people uh, astray. Uh, because here, when we're talking about the application, it includes a checklist and so forth. Those are all part of the question that we're asking the applicant. Uh, mm -hmm. But other elsewhere, we refer to the application as what the applicant is asking for from us. Oh, and okay. in fact, usually that's the way in which we use the word application. Uh, and you can see that over and over if you turn back to the checklist for special permit applications if, in fact, yeah. the very expression special permit application is what they give to us, not the form yeah. that we give them to fill out. So I think that we need to get the idea of form back in there uh, one way or another. I understand. I think I understand the reason for not doing it is because we don't technically have a, a form in writing the way we, we did before. It's an online form. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that we should be able to tr to try to keep those concepts separate because otherwise people are going to get confused as to what an application means. So if I was to change the word form to format, so, so the application format for appeal special permit or variance shall be approved by the board. Does that make sense? Let me do it. I I guess. I mean, we do it's talk really about online form forms person. a lot. Yeah. I mean, in effect, the, the, the stuff we, that we, we just... actually... We could just keep calling it a form. And it well, just I, happens to be online. Yeah. I mean, I I think that helps avoid the, I don't think that people will get confused about that if you if okay. we did that, even if there's a little bit of a cognitive dissonance about it. And in the time between I when I wrote this and now um Zralson has added uh, an online appeal form. So that would come back in. Um as one of the things we have and part right. of our online applications. Um, and I, and I, I just need to come up with better language for the course, the list of current fees that be referenced. The checklist of required documentation reference to the list of current fees. I'll work on that. Um, and then under documentation, the word appeal does will come back in under 222. That's we're including that again. Um, to online posting of documents. When this had originally come about, Everything that came in in paper and almost nothing came in in PDF. And we we're trying to encourage people to do PDF. Now we don't accept anything, but. Um, the applicant shall provide to the board PDF copies of all materials requested on the application with the understanding that the documents will be posted to the town's website or included in an online posting of the hearing agenda. Um, And I don't think that the board necessarily has to have an online, have a print copy at inspectional services, because if you go to inspectional services, they'll just bring it up on a 
computer there. So I think we can remove that. Um, and then under coordination, um, special program applications for lots meeting the requirements 542 may be, shall be heard by the Arlington Redevelopment Board under environmental design review instead of by the board. So just clarifying that. Um, and then pre-hearing process, applicants should meet with the building inspector or their designee to determine the appropriate review by the board. The inspector should provide the appropriate forms and other documents as appropriate for the required review, including the res residential design guidelines. Um, again, their designee, their designee, uh, submission of application fees. If not using the town's online payment platform, a receipt showing payment of the required fees shall be included with the application. Um, scheduling a hearing by the administrator once the building inspector or their designee again. Um, preparation of planning memorandums. So this is one we've kind of gone back and forth on because it's not us. Uh, director of the Department of Planning and Community Development shall review board applications and provide to the board any recommendations for board consideration. Town planning staff shall will submit recommendations on cases based on the residential design guidelines. Uh, that last sentence, maybe I need to take out. Right. I think just that would leave it sense. as that first sentence as modified. And then hearing procedure, all meetings shall be open. Meetings shall typically be scheduled for the second and fourth Tuesday of each month at 7.30 p.m. Other meeting days and times shall be scheduled as required to meet specific hearing requirements. Until such time is no longer permissible under state law, meetings shall be held using an online platform provided by the town. Mr. Chairman? Yes. What, what would we lose by saying may instead of shall there? And the reason I'm asking is mm -hmm. that um, th these are really are just basically permissive things. Uh, yeah. unless, uh, and I don't, I want to minimize the number of times when somebody can come back and challenge something that we did because we didn't follow our own rules. Yep. And so every time you say shall, you're giving somebody the opportunity to make an argument like that. And so when you really mean to say it'll normally happen or it will mostly happen or it may happen, but not, but we won't necessarily always do it this way. It's better okay. to say may and, and not box yourself in. Got it. Okay. Um. The testimony, which is in the word changing gender. Um, the, at the conclusion of testimony, questioning, and discussion for each hearing, chair shall call for a vote of the board to either close the public hearing or to continue the public hearing to a date certain. So that is our new current direction uh, for the decision. After hearing has been closed, the chair shall appoint a member of the board to prepare a written decision, including the vote of each present voting member, setting forth clearly the reason for the board's decision and for its other official actions. Um, in a subsequent public meeting, the church will call for a vote of the board on the prepared written decision, concurring vote of four members, yada, yada. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. On the decision, I was thinking maybe that it would be useful to, in, on 3.4.1. Yeah. I didn't delete the language, including the vote of, the, of each present voting member. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, I, I get that that may be on various procedural things or the vote on whether to close the hearing. And, but I don't know that we need to say that particularly because we can, we'll, we will, in fact, just do that. Um, the, the place where it, what it gets, it gets confusing because ultimately, 
It's the the proposed written decision that is being adopted, and it's the vote that takes place after the decision is written. That is that's the one that the chair certifies, mm -hmm. and so presumably, uh, uh, that's the vote that counts. And it sounds and it, it it's a little confusing to say that 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 will be reflected in the in the hearing it, itself. I think we should just make clear that what we're doing, I mean, what what's actually going on is when you close the hearing, is the same as it is in a forty B. After that, you can't take any more information, and but you can deliberate. And mm -hmm. in fact, we could, and sometimes have occasion deliberated a more some on the decision. You somebody could say, you know, I've been thinking about it, and I changed my vote. Or, or I didn't vote before, but now I'm not persuaded anymore, or something. Or now that I read this, I see it doesn't look right to me, and I think we should do something else. That's all legitimate. It doesn't. It's like I'm very unlikely to happen. Hopefully, it won't happen. But, um, but basically, closing the hearing just says we're not taking more information, and then actually deciding the case is what we do at the next meeting and that's important for because under the statute that's the thing that triggers our obligation to get the record before the, to the clerk within 14 days um and i i do all of that is to say that this language seems to me to work okay but to me i would i, I would include proposed written decision in the before and then just and then not include including the vote of each present you know voting member and and leave that up to informal procedure. Okay. Well, I don't know. We talked about the clue votes. Um, and then we had a, originally we had in here that the decision will be provisional. We're getting away from that. So that's going yep. away. And then voting members of the board shall sign the official copy of the written decision. However, the board may vote to grant the chair the authority to sign decisions on behalf of the board. Such grants should be limited to a period of one year, um, which is what we have done. And that was it. So, Mr. Chairman. Are there any... <clears throat> yes. Um, so. Because I just overdid it, I actually read all the parts that we that weren't changed. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's stuff that we need to go back and think about. Some things okay. that I think we're just paraphrasing legal things that are said in other places. I mean, for example, we don't have to have in our rules uh, anything about whether or not people can be reappointed or not. That's mm -hmm. not for us to say. If the select board or if the town meeting were to change the way that I'm not quite sure who has that authority, but we certainly don't have the authority to decide what the length of a term is or anything like that, that either comes from some other law or, uh, well, it, it invariably comes from, from some other law. So I think that some of that is stuff that we don't really have. What we really need to have here are the things that des that describe what we do and that people can rely on in deciding how to how to to, to interact with us. So, you know, things like what we just said about the hearings and that sort of thing is, is I think, uh, there. Uh, I do think that where what we do is simply determined by state law or by the zoning bylaw, it's confusing it, and potentially opens up issues. If you paraphrase it and then you don't get it entirely right, or you can create a situation where there there are controversies over it, so I think that where we, what we I have to say is just that we're going to follow the law. We at the very least we ought to we ought to have something that says that when it says we can follow the law, that you know we're not purporting to to try to say what the that the law is any different from what it is the way we normally do with the definitions, um, because whatever the statute says governs no matter no matter how we say it. And then there's just some places in here where I'm not sure. I mean, for example, look at the coordination with other boards and towns. We say that lots that meet the criteria for review by the Arlington Conservation Commission must receive a favorable review by that commission before being heard by the board. Well, that just is not true. 
They don't have to. There's nothing in anywhere that we could say that says that has to happen. And if we just say, were to say, actually say, you know, CONSACOM hasn't made a decision and we're not going to make a decision either. And the statutory deadlines pass. We're, it's, mm -hmm. it's our goose that's cooked. We can't say that. We can say normally it wouldn't or we prefer that it doesn't or, or you know, something soft. But but we can't announce that something shall happen when it puts us in an impossible legal situation. Um, and that's true of the Historic Districts Commission with the Tree mm -hmm. Commission. We're talking about the building permit, and I don't even know why we're commenting on the building permit at all. Um, and these are all things that are already in here. They're not new things yeah. that were added. But there's really a bunch of them. And I, you know, even when you look at the procedure, it says here on on variances, I'm not so sure that that what what we say doesn't really uh doesn't describe what we do. Uh you know, what it says literally in variances to authorize uh, that to authorize on appeal or in upon petition in cases where a particular use is sought for which no permit is required, mm -hmm. we don't do that. I mean, theoretically, what this does is it says, as some jurisdictions do, that you that if it's the, an action by the building inspector, then the building inspector decides that you can't do it, and uh, and then there's an appeal from that. And here you'd only do it by petition in those cases like the shed cases that we were dealing with earlier, where you mm -hmm. don't have to get a building permit. So the only way they can appeal is by filing a, or try to get a vari variance is by filing a petition. And it's OK. Mm -hmm. It's possible to do it that way, but we don't do it that way. And, you know, I I just all of this is to say we we can't deal with all of these things tonight. There are other places to appeal, it seems to me, that are attempt to restate what's in the state law and appeals misses it doesn't have it quite right and that we need to do other things. And, you know, we can't really go through all of all of that tonight. But I think that we should put it on our list that we need to just do a broader look at all of this and mm -hmm. uh try to make sure that that we say may when we mean may and and don't and and maybe simplify it and try to be a little clearer in it because I think this is one of those things where ultimately this is supposed to be precise. this is supposed to be guiding people in knowing how to how to proceed with us and uh, and some parts of this are are not really and sometimes that's just because state law is really a pain in the neck and uh, but when we when we all we mean to say is that we're going to follow state law, the first thing we should say is that we're following this provision in state law, and that's and, and that should be it. There'll be some positions like with the notice requirements where we want to put it all in one place so that Colleen has one place to look for it and doesn't have to go through various. And so there's a reason for doing that sort of thing. But uh, but I think that this could be made simpler and clearer and. Uh, and that in some cases we need to give more thought to what we're saying we'll do because uh, this has been written a long time ago, and uh, and I sometimes you just don't sometimes it isn't tracking state law when it looks like it should be tracking state law and it probably once did, and it just need, it just needs to get spruced up and slimmed down. Okay. Mm. Um. Yeah. No, I think that's fine and reasonable we should try to set a time frame for ourselves because otherwise i think this will go on and on and on without resolution um so why don't i just put this on our agenda for two hearings from now or I guess I would ask um Ms. Ralston, what's up what nights are looking light at the moment? Right now the tenth of September only has one because the second one backed out. 
That is sounding like a great night. <laughs> and the legal okay. notices have to go out Thursday, so there's nobody else that can get on. Okay. All right. So I will put, I will ask uh, Mr. Olson to put on the agenda for September 10th um, for us to continue the discussion about the special permit checklist and the uh, rules and regs. Perfect. This is, Mr. Chair, can I ask you a question? Of course. I'm just I'm just realizing. So the next meeting is the 27th. Is that right? Yeah. I am away on vacation, and Ooh. um, I, so I'm still happy to write the decision. But do we have enough voting members if I write the decision to approve it? So you, I had asked you to look at. I believe Amherst Street, was that right? That's right, yeah. Um, and I think since that was two hearings, right? Um, I think may need to Here. ask. This this can't be Amherst Street. We just proved that. This would be Mass Ave. No, 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 you're right. Sorry, not Amherst. Oh, oh, sorry, Mass Ave. Uh, yes, Mass Ave, sorry. The, the porch. Yeah. Yes. Um. So I would need to ask um miss i could ask uh miss hoffman if she wouldn't mind uh mulling in on uh the meeting she missed on 314 mass Ave. no i can do that okay thank you elaine perfect no. okay great well i'll get that over to you with plenty of time before i leave then awesome Okay, so then where's our agenda? That is everything on our agenda for tonight. Um, with that, uh, the upcoming meeting, so on the 27th, uh, we'll be missing Mr. Riccardelli. Um, there are a few uh, items already on the docket uh, for the 27th. Um, so encourage people to go ahead and download information, take a look at that. Um, and then on September 10th, we just have the one hearing and then we'll discuss again the, the checklist and the rules and regs. And then after that, we have September 24th, um, which I will, at this point, I think I am not available on September 24th, um, but we will, I need to check my schedule. And then we're on to October 8th. Um, so those are the upcoming meetings. Uh, as always, if anybody knows they're not going to make a meeting, just let me know ahead. Um, we can plan around that. Um, with that, unless there's anything else, I think we're ready to conclude our meeting. So I'd like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I would especially like to thank uh, Colleen Ralston and Mike Champa for their assistance in preparing for and hosting our online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding that the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. And if anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. And a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Holly. The vote of the board to adjourn. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Holly? Aye. Uh, Mr. Riccadelli? Yes. Ms. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. And the chair votes yes, and we are adjourned. Thank you all so very much. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Good night. Good night, Good night. Good night. Good night everyone. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.